that uh, to also summarize what we said. And the point of what we, what we discussed last time is uh, uh, the essence of the animal soul, which is the point of which is a yeshut, isness, self, sense of self, separate existence and independent being as being, that, that's the core of the animal soul. And in his words, from that come all the bad traits, all the evil traits. And then he, he starts, uh, he also organizes them in a sense. He says, uh, he breaks them down to the four elements that uh, compose every creation and then categorizes different traits in, uh, in accordance with the elements that they stem from. And uh, we discussed for the past couple of weeks, the order and a few details and words. I mean, there's a lot of words here to say, but uh, we'll move on. And uh, with the point of everything, other than the, again, the diukim that we made, the nakuda is that every one of the points he makes <clears throat> is all an expression of the core of the animal. So the core is, is yeshus, isness, which is what we very often call pride uh, in a more, again, in a more, in a more seminal way, like we said, even though here, as we mentioned, he, uh, he, he counts or he uh, categorizes pride later. So we also explained last week that there, that, that, that trait pride can be referring to, to one of two things. Very often in Chabad, it refers to Yeshus, which is the etzim, the the essence of the animal. So here simply is the, he means the trait of pride, which is again, your image of self, the elaboration of your sense of self, the, again, the image that you develop, that you, uh, that you cultivate stemming from your intrinsic seminal sense of existence. So that's a point we made last week. I'm not gonna go over it. And then, and so forth, he goes on to all of the four elements. Now again, the point, the, the simplest shot is that to notice how each one of these traits is all, all it is, is an expression of the essence. The same thing as we'll see in the next chapter, that the, the same logic is how he explains the godly soul as well. The godly soul is, is Hashem. And therefore all the traits of the godly soul are all an expression, an expression of Hashem. Just like the animal soul is a self, like a, a sense of separation from Hashem, and all of its traits are an elaboration of that sense of separation, understanding myself, feeling myself, expressing my that self. The godly soul is Hashem's self. That's the point of logic. Now, if you, <clears throat> in the details, so we mentioned four different, uh, maybe we'll even go over all four in light of that point. Now, th again, this is the pshat mamash of, of what needs to be understood. So we explained relatively in length the element of fire. Said that it's a, again simple. Why gava is simple? Why that's a, an expression of self. And uh, even even preceding that, he mentions anger, and that we spoke about in length last week. <clears throat> the next element he mentions is water, and he categorizes there tavot tanugi, all the tavot. So it's again very simple. Or every tava, it's also very simple, but it's also okay, a point of simple insight that every tava, every lust, is and it's all an elaboration of pride. It's it's feeling having a self. That's the essence of the animal soul. A rising that self is fire. And feeling that self is uh, water, you know, growing it. Uh, any that's what any lust is is like enhancing or meddling with my being. You, if I, I don't know. You eat a uh, tasty something, so the the MSG it tickles your tongue, and that's the that's the pleasure. If you will, the tava of the animal soul is you sensing yourself. And so if you take, a, I don't know, a, a chocolate bar, then why is there pleasure in a chocolate bar? Because it, it, it enhances a sense. You feel be, your being more. You're more being. 
All tavot are like that. It's all an elaboration of your sense of self. But we could say that this is, again, I don't want to get into this too much, but this is why, in general, in Chassidus, lusts are not a good thing. Usually it's something uh, something that's looked upon with a critical eye. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that very carefully because it's, it's not like in Musar, if you open books of Musar, not Hasidic books, then there it's not clear what's worse. Tava, tava, lusts could be the worst thing, maybe even worse than pride. Now, if you learn Hasidus, so that's definitely not the case. Your pride is all bad. And lusts, in many places in the Torah, that it says good things about lusts. Yeah, it says Tavat Tzadikim Achtov. Kadosh Baruch Hu, it says Nitava Kadosh Baruch Hu Leiludiyavat Achtonim. Kadosh Baruch Hu has a lust, and lusts aren't are definitely not as inherently bad by definition as selfness, as pride. Again, like we explained, because pride is the core of concealing Hashem. All the lusts are are the elaboration of that core. <clears throat> so why is a lust bad? When is a lust bad? I mean, obviously, also in Hasidus, can't be ignored that the that usually lusts are mentioned in a derogatory connotation. It's not uh, usually. But why, why is that the case? Because, again, because of the point we mentioned now, that what most of our animal or natural lusts are, are the lust to satisfy our delusionary pride. Again, in the core. Like in the core of every lust, even eating a chocolate bar, is, is looking, again, in depth. If you just take it superficially, it's it really, it's not so bad. You know, nothing wrong with eating a chocolate bar. I mean, it's not, the superficial uh, practice isn't, isn't an Avera. It's not an Avera, and it's also not a psychological uh, problem. It's, it's, all, it's all the same. It might not be so healthy. So I don't know if you should eat too many chocolate bars, but it's not something we're going to keep Definitely not something to go on about. We're not going to write books against chocolate bars. Right? You're not going to crusade it. Why, so why Becholzot in Hasidus, you can find Gilu, a lot of uh, criticism around, definitely around people uh, devoting their life to lusts, and, but also Gilu Bechol. You can find an avoid it, like the greatest Hasidim or Tzadikim, they wouldn't eat chocolate bars. They didn't eat chocolate bars. So maybe there is something not so Hasidish about eating chocolate bars. Maybe. Why? Again, because somewhere in the core of that lust, even though we're choosing a very superficial, simple, mundane thing, but still, even any lust, in the core, there is there is a, a warping of the soul. It, it's driven seminally from your uh, assumption of, of fullness, of being an exi- a, something, a yesh, Right, isness, and therefore, when you find yourself lacking, you're uncomfortable with that feeling. You don't like feeling that you lack. You like feeling that you're strong. You don't need anybody. You don't need anything. You don't like needing. You don't like being exposed to your neediness. Now, if I take this in a distinct, drastic psychological scenario in life, so it becomes much more, much more defined taking these very deep, profound points and trying to project them on why you eat a chocolate bar is presumptuous. Okay, well, it's not, uh, that, this is why Bemet and Hasidus, there is, we don't crusade against chocolate bars, but still somewhere, even in just eating a chocolate bar, there is that, the, the basic drive, like eating, is, is again, in your animal soul, is driven from a lack of comfortability with hunger. You don't like feeling that you need something, that you're, that you're dependent. And the pleasure of fullness when you do eat something is, again, seminally, it's a pleasure, a bad pleasure of feeling, of like reimbursing your pride. Here, you know, I'm, I'm, do, I'm doing great on my own. I don't need anybody. So again, it's, it, if you take like such a phrasing, and you project it on every bite of a, of a sandwich you take, it's, it's very presumptuous, but it's true. It's not untrue. That's why you can find in Hasidus a generally critical view of lusts. 
but not that lusts are bad. Again, they're only bad when, like we're explaining now, when what they actually are, are an expansion and a development of the seminal pride. And then the lusts are bad. And that's, most of our lusts are like that. Most of our, of our animal souls notions are like that. But you, you could have different lusts. Like your godly soul also has lusts, also has natural tendencies. Like you, I don't know, you see a, like it's a, you see a tzaddik, you see a very good person. Like you read a book about a big tzaddik. Let's say you read, the, you read a book about Rabari Levine. You've ever read that book of Rabari Levine? You read, okay, so, so immediate, if you're a Jew, every Jew, you read a book like that, you immediately want to be that way. You have like a natural lust, Halivai, I was such a devoted uh, tzaddik. You, know. you hear a story about, about a, you meet some Chabad Shliach in the end of the world. Immediately you have a lust to be good. <laughs> no, that's, that's not bad. That's good. It's ta'avat tzadikim achtov. It's a good lust. It's also natural lust. And it's not something you need to contemplate. It's natural. It's like a Jew has, his animal soul has midot, has lust. Also his, his godly soul has midot. Usually those lusts aren't, aren't necessarily as strong as buying a, a chocolate bar. That's usually uh, more, I don't know, more... Uh, I wouldn't say it's stronger. I'd say it's more uh, because it's more superficial. Then it's it's more common. It's more on the surface. It's on the surface, uh, so it's more noticeable. Not that it's necessarily stronger. You come again. I just said that to note that sadness, that that uh, that that lusts aren't inherently bad. Why does he call them bad here and why very often? Because again, when they are an elaboration or a cultivation or a cover up of your pride, then they're serving or they're expanding the core of concealment of Hashem's unity. And that's the point of bad. And so all the traits here are like that. All the traits he, he explains are all to note how all of your structure of your personality of your animal soul is an expansion of the point of separation from Hashem. The next thing he says is, It's also the longest. He says four things. <laughs> I don't know how to translate this. Uh, I mean, is like, a, what, what's it? Anybody have an English translation in front of you? Fr frivolity. Okay, so that's a word I don't know, but yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> it sounds like something uh, empty and, and uh, something like that. I mean, Hallelujah is like a, 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 a not rectified joy. That's what usually what the word is used for. Go to a party, it's not Bektusha at all. You just make a mess and get drunk. That's called Hallelujah, like being rambunctious and, and wild. A wild, uh, unchecked, uh, party. That's called holy look. Late Sanut is, a, is like cynicism or, or being a clown. Remember the word late san. Okay, so being a clown, like being cynical, that's late sanut. Itpa'ut is, uh, how do they translate it? It's not pride. Bo it's boasting. Boasting, exactly. It's boasting. Bedvarim betelim is just uh, irrelevant things, They're just shooting the breeze, you, uh, emptiness, sitting around and shooting the breeze. Again, first of all, it's, it's interesting to know that a person has a lust to do that. One of your lusts is to sit around and do nothing. There's a lust to do that, to sit and shoot the breeze. If people like doing that. Let's get together and do nothing together. Okay, that's not so good. Now, what, what is all, he says that these four, again, they're boasting, and they, what was the word for hallelujah again? I'll learn a new word. Unrectified joy seems like a good description, as you said. Okay, but it's also a rambunctious kind of thing. Now, the word is like a, a wild sort of joy. And late sanut, cynicism, all these things, he, he, he categorizes them as being part of the element of air. Where it's making like like the expression you're making hot air, you know it's it's fussing, 
Air is all fussing, fussing about yourself. And what, what's the order here? You are, and then you cultivate, that's lusts, you cultivate your being, and then you fuss over your being. Like you try to expand yourself like a balloon. That's the element of air. So all these things here are all fussing in the core, right? If you're if you're having if you're being like unrectified joy, because again, it's, it's fussing over yourself, it's, uh, synthetically pumping kivyachol as if energy expanding, jumping around, making making a ruckus of yourself. In Hasidus, it's called blitut. Blitut means uh, bulging. Called like, what? Bulging. Blitut. Blitut? Blitut. Blitut means to make a bulge of yourself. To, to be noticed. Bli, bli like without. Blitut. It's to, and word. it's with tet. Bl, blitut. Yeah. yeah. Livlot means to bulge. A blita is a bulge. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The blitut, as, as a psych, like as a mental trait, is one's attempt to bulge, to be noticed. So, like a little kid wants attention, so he, he makes a he makes a ruckus. You, I exist. He's, he's trying his existence. He's fussing over his existence. And so that's like again, just like the fray, what he calls the element of air. Is exactly what the phrase says that you're making hot air. So you're just you're blowing your your balloon up. He's making a fuss over yourself. So all these traits, again, that's the third, like the third, it's more superficial. There's the core of sense of existence, the immediate expansion of that is anger and pride. Then there's lusts and a little bit more superficial, there's just hot air, just making a lot of rocket fussing over yourself. And the last thing is the element of earth is absolute, absolute sadness and depression and, and, uh, and laziness. I'm sorry, laziness and sadness, which are both, again, it's just what, what does it mean to be sad? To feel, to feel myself, you too. Uh, to say that my existence is very heavy. You know, I, I am a critical mass. I am a stone that Hashem can't lift. That's, that's what <laughs> sadness is. You sink into your quilt and you be. You, and this is a lust. This is a ta'ava. Your person has a ta'ava to be depressed. This is one of the worst ta'avot in the world. It's kind of tricky because people, as if, hate to be depressed. That's not true. People are addicted to, to depression. People love depression because it's again, it's it's just you get to be yourself completely and sink into your mud. It's very a lot of fun. So, so, so that that's the, the the final element. Now we noted here. We're not going to get into it at length. And this is much much later on in Tanya that that, that this is the last the earth depression sadness. Is, is the last of the traits of the animal soul. It's re really, it is the critical mass of your animal soul. It's the sum of everything. If you phrase the rest of your traits derogatory, derogatorily, like we just phrased them, if you make fun of your pride and that all of your lusts are all just trying to compensate for your nothingness, like we phrased it just now, and that all your your hot air, all the fuss you make of yourself, you're so high and mighty and you boast and everything, it's all nothing, it's all air. It's just gone with the wind. Once you phrase it that way, you realize it, so you really sense that the sum of your existence is nothing. You're just a pile of depression. And that's what comes of, of all of the other traits. Now, this, this trait, you, that realization of all of my existence being hot air, being nothing. You, everything goes up in smoke. We said the idiom for this in the Hasidus is the red heifer, burning the korban. That everything, like all the image and the volume of the cow goes up in smoke. 
and all that's left is earth, the effer, the, 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 the dust, the, how do you say effer? Ashes. 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 The ashes are the earth. That's what was really here. It's a little, tiny little pile of ashes. Again, when there was wind and fire, it looked like a cow mooing, it looked very impressive. But when you bring it down to its net value, you get a tiny little pile of depression. <laughs> that, that's called sadness. That really, because of all your existence is, is an elaboration of a delusion. Your sense of independent self and self-existence and pride and value and worth, and it's all nothing. So when it sums up, then what you're left with is a pile of depression. Also experientially, usually in life, it's just different times in life. Sometimes you feel this way. There are highs and lows. But the sum of everything is depression. So that's like the tamsi, the, the, the essence of, of your personality, is this point of, of nothingness. Now, that, that experience, like being exposed to your lack of value, that could be the worst trait. And that depression could be the very worst thing. And it could drive, why would it be the worst thing? Because it could drive you to again, the unpleasantness of that realization, or even the fear of that realization could, could be the, what's driving you constantly to continue cultivating your pride and, and blowing hot air, not to burn the cow down, but not to reach that point of zero value. So the, the fear of sadness is what's driving all the other bad traits in a sense. But also this point of realization could be the beginning of rectification, what purifies you, like the ashes of the red heifer. So that's, as we'll see much later on in Tanya, Yesoda Afar, the earth, sadness, is of, of all of the traits he just mentioned, that's the only trait he'll explain that's rectifiable. All the other traits, in order to rectify them, you really need them to go up in smoke. You need to dissipate. The, the delusionary nature needs to dissipate. The pride needs to break, and then all the hot air blows out, and all of your lusts dry up. What's left? What's left is a, is a is a again a pile of neediness, which could be depression or it could be loneliness. You can, and that can be turned. That can be flipped. This is maybe the most important topic in Tanya. But it's only explained from chapter 26. We've studied it before. But that, that's what he expa starts explaining in chapter 26. But you could just, you just want to make that note here that the order of how we describe things, on the one hand, all these traits are an elaboration and an expression of the core of isness. But the last, again, the last trait of earth is actually a realization that your core of isness isn't. And that's already the beginning of rectification. So even though sadness and depression are a very, very negative thing, it may be the most negative thing, but still there's something there that's true. Like there's this, like an inkling of a true realization of your true value of self. And therefore, it's, it's rectifiable. It's a very important point for the continuation. So Mikomokom, we, after that, we read on and we spoke about Klippa Snoiga, how in a, a Jew there's also good traits, which also come from the presence of the godly self. So all that we finished already. So, it's what Wait, so, I, so I have yeah. my second question. So you were speaking about this idea of demanding, uh, um, demanding Mashiach coming from a place of shiftless. But demanding is a very strong word. It's very hard for me to see how it fits together with shiftless. We told a story last week, like an, uh, an allegory, in order to explain uh, entitlement which is what we called anger. Like the, the source of all anger is all a sense of entitlement that someone's taking from you. So we told a story, like a hypothetical story about a, a father who, who his son fights with him and then the father finances him every month. And, and how after 20 years of this ridiculous situation, if it suddenly stops, then as, as funny as it, that would be, the per that son feels he has a bone to pick you. He's makbid, he's angry. Even though, even if you ask him, he'll be ashamed to say it because he doesn't really think it's logical, but it's still experientially, that's how he feels. 
נכון? remember that story. So, so the question about the... I lost my train of thought. What was the question? Why did I mention demanding, that? How does demanding Mashiach fit in with shiftless? So we said, that's what I think that was last class. That's how we reached that, that the words you're quoting. That we said that, that uh, how does that boy feel? We described his consciousness in a very non-rectified way. But if we were to try and describe it a little bit more rectified, then you know, what, what, was, what did that story that I just re-mentioned, what did that story look to point out? That, that even though there's no justification, just by existing, you develop entitlement. The sense of entitlement, Kibu, it grows just by being. It's called, even in halacha, there's such a, a notion, it's called chazaka. And I'm Kibu, I have a, I'm held, my reality. So once you, Hashem, kept me around one day, two days, three days, <laughs> I was better yesterday than I am today, so Look, you, it's like a status quo. You can't change the status quo. This is the status quo. Not that I'm in, I, again, I don't think that I'm initially truly entitled to exist, but since I was existed unentitled yesterday and I was existed unentitled this morning, then I become entitled to my unentitled existence. That's like the sensation where entitlement comes from. Just like this boy and his father. Right? So seemingly we're, we're bashing entitlement. So, so you could think that the more rectified notion would be like a, a, a proud form of lack of entitlement. That's what we wanted to cancel yesterday, last week. So that, that misunderstanding. But very often, you, like if you, I'll continue my story, my other way. If you take that kid, you let him hear our class. So he'll be very ashamed, right? Because he knows he doesn't, you know, doesn't deserve, how, how can I be angry at my father? So what could very well be his reaction, that boy? Once you, you, you surface, you expose him to the ridicule of his anger. It could very well be that he, like you get from your kids very often. So when he feels that he was very wrong, so he goes into his room and says, I don't need anything from you. I don't want your money. Don't give me anything, nothing. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve anything. I don't want anything. I'm going to die in my room quietly. Leave me alone. Like people, a person sheds entitlement by as if not wanting anything. That's not shiftless either. That's again, that's more pride. Real shiftless is the, that after I expose you to your to the lack of just to justifiability to your entitlements, it doesn't change your 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 yearning. You still want the money. I want you to finance me. I can't. It, it, I, I I need it, but I don't deserve. It. Again, if I. If my discovery of not deserving disables my, my ability to, to want, that's pride. Because it's, it, it's, it's shameful to want when you lack entitlement. So I want to say I want and I deserve. If you take my deserving, my sense of deserving, I have no real deserving, it's all delusion. But in order to be able to want, I develop a delusion of deserving. And if you take that delusion, then very often my means of defense is that I stop wanting. Because I'm not willing to want without deserving. Because that makes me like a beggar. Makes me like, a, again, like a poor person. Like a, a miskan. Makes me, it makes me beshifu. Makes me lowly. I don't want to be lowly. I want to think that I'm all that. I'm, I'm, I'm big. I'm strong. So if I can't find any entitlement, then I don't want anything. I'd rather die than ask 
ask for chesed chinam. It's all pride. That's, I mean, that's the core of pride. So true shiflus is not that you change your demanding. It's not that you change your, your, your will or even the intensity of your will. No, you want, just like when you think you're entitled, you demand. And you discover your entitlement is nothing but a delusion to justify your lusts. Then you, you still demand just as much, maybe even more. You still want with all the intensity, but that lacks any legitimacy. Now, if you do that, then you feel garnished. If, if you have to ask, you, 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 you're willing to cope with your will whilst experiencing your lack of entitlement, then uh, that's true shiflus. And this is mamash, the, the precise phrasing of how the Rebbe always discussed Mashiach. Always. Mamash, this is the, exactly what, all the sikhs. On the one hand, there's a complete lack of entitlement. On the other hand, there's a completely radically uncompromising demand that I have to have. That, that's, that's a very paradoxical state. If you if you needed to demand something without any entitlement, it would be very, very difficult for you to demand it. Like our first tendency in anything we want is always to seek out points of entitlement to justify our demands, to lean our demands on entitlement. That's why we're so, we're so, uh, we're so uh, anxious to, to justify all of our entitlements because it's, it's what enables us to demand all of our demands. And I realize somewhere subconsciously that if I, if I admit to my lack of entitlement, then I'll have to stop asking for everything I want. I have to stop wanting. So really the secret of life is the ability to want without entitlement. But not, and not only to want, but to want strongly, like not to lose any of the, any of the intensity of your wills like just like in that like existential example we said, I want Hashem to create me. And even though I, I, I'm willing to realize my utter lack of, of entitlement to exist, but nonetheless, and even more so, I want Hashem to create me and I demand that he creates me and I want to be. And the, the, again, the concoction of those two realizations is what concocts shiflus. I want very much, and I'm entitled not at all. Okay, so, that, so your entire existence is just a, a yearn, like a, a non-legitimate yearn. And you are. It's, it's called living living from a Kaddish Baruch Hu's open hand. Who's free, open hand. So you're, so you're like a beggar. You're like, what's a beggar? Your mere existence is just chesed chinam, a matnat chinam. So if you really feel that way, then it's very, uh, it's very shiflut, it's very low, lowering. It's also, again, hands down, this is the happiest experience in the world. There's nothing more joyful. This is the basis of all joy in life. But it's also very, very low. The paradoxical realization of entitlement of lack of entitlement with yearning, with wanting, demanding. Even. Now, if you, if anyone decides that paradox, you you shut down, then it becomes pride. Definitely, if you shut down lack of it, if you think you're entitled, that's definitely pride. But if you don't think you're entitled, but you're not willing to, to want, right? So no, so I don't care. So I'll, so I don't need anything from you. It's also pride. You know, so, so you have both sides are what make it sh shift. Interesting, interesting. So one question on that, when we, but you know, when people are speaking about wanting Mashiach, it's, it's often connected with, you know, there's been so much mysterious nefesh over history by the Jewish people, and it's all added up, and it, it's present, it's often presented in a way that, look, we have all this evidence that we deserve it. So is that not the right way to go about it, you're saying? No, no, no I don't think so. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, that's not how I understand it. 
That's not how I understand. I, I also I don't think anybody really says that. I don't Maza really thinks that. I don't think anybody, if you'd ask him. Wait, so in, so in your sum of things, you think you deserve Mashiach? And he'd say yes. No, no. Or the Jewish people deserve Mashiach. Everybody else but me. <laughs> yes, that would be a sane conclusion. Okay. So that, I, that, that I agree. For that for sure you should feel. But except for me, everybody deserves Mashiach. But there's even one person in the world that would, would add it, that would, again, without deep contemplation. You know, simply you'd ask him, you, you, you think that after everything, the whole of God's... The bottom line is that you think you deserve Mashiach. I don't think there's one person in the world that would say yes to that. Uh, that, that you deserve it. You're, 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 you doesn't deserve it. You're entitled to it. It's yours. You've earned it. It's not earnable. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not something earnable. No one would say that. So, that, so since that's, uh, again, since I don't think anybody thinks that, I definitely don't think that. Why, even though people don't think that, they, they don't realize they don't think that. Well, again, I agree that if you look in the Rebbe's sikhahs and things, you can see very often that the Rebbe's demanding is more prominent than his lowliness. Sometimes you can see the opposite, that his lowliness is much more prominent than his demanding. Well, no, but it's, again, to me, it's pashut legamre, that, that that's because Bemet, the Rebbe is, is, is a type of tzaddik, that these two paradoxical the edges coexist. That's why he's such a messianic figure. His ability to demand from a place of utter lack of entitlement is what constitutes his personality. So the when you hear the Rebbe speak, he throws you from edge to edge. What, what, what is he saying? Is he, like on the one hand, he's demanding why do I think the Rebbe, the Rebbe feels entitled? Because I, I, Kilo, I think in my mind that for me to demand something that way, he probably deserves it very much. He must be a very, very big topic because I could never demand something that way without justifying. It. So if I see the Rebbe standing and, and knocking on the table, the Mashiach has to come. So I subconsciously assume that he, that he feels entitled. There's no one without entitlement could demand so strong. But that's not true. It's not true. He's a tzaddik bemis. He did no. If you, therefore, if you hear the Rebbe speak about his shiflus one day, then you'd hear the utter opposite edge. You'd imagine immediately the person's talking that way could never ask for anything. Also, not for Mashiach. You also admit that hearing a, a very very big tzaddik is is taking something we can study in micro and try to understand, and then showing it to you in the most radical example possible. So it's very hard to contain. It's very hard to, to, to keep on with the Rebbe's train of thought. Because, yeah, that's why he's the Rebbe. I'm not thinking it's not the, we're not the Rebbe's. If we can understand this in theory a little bit in our head, that's already an accomplishment. The Rebbe doesn't think so. The Rebbe thinks we should all be just like him. Like the Rebbe said very often, that's not what's the problem. We should all be just like the Hashem. So that's uh, that's the the beginning here of chapter one. We've gone over. Uh, so so let's let's read the the last uh, three lines. We'll finish chapter one today. So uh, so he says after we said because of of a Jew having an, a godly soul, which is uh, an experience, a conscious experience of Hashem's value other than my value of self. So that softened, it's like a counter weight to your sense of self. And it, it inevitably it softens, it gentles all these traits we've just said. Similarly to studying about, just like when we talk about these things then just exposing the true nature of all of my bad traits already kind of shuns me a bit. You know, make, makes my pride a little bit less impressive, makes my lusts a little bit less intense. Because, so same thing, uh, feeling, experiencing Hashem's presence, Hashem's uh, value, uh, even a tiny little bit, uh, 
mematen, the word is mematen, I don't know how you say mematen. It's like softening or a little, the matun means to be paced. Oh, paced. Moderate, moderating. Yeah, that moderates, exactly. Moderates your animals, moderates your yeshus. That moderated yeshus is called klipat noga. You know, the, the, the moderator of layers of your, of your yeshus, of your isness, of your pride, are called noga. What, what's the word noga? Noga means that it's, again, it's, it's isness, but it's, it's a lit in isness, an enlightened in isness that, you, that, that Hashem's presence shines into, so it's softened, it's moderated. Well, that itself is a result of having a godless one. But, but the, if you don't have a conscious experience of Hashem's value, then your entire personality is just not moderated. So again, you wouldn't call it not moderated, you just call it normal. You know? again, that that you can moderate it, Yeshus is a chidush. That, that, that a, a Jew's animal soul is moderated is a result of there being a countering value exposed in his personality. But if there would be no countering value, then your entire sense of self would evolve around yourself. There, there'd be no reason for it to be other than that like a monkey or a cow. There's no reason for any self to value anything but its self because there's nothing else there. That that we say, that we see, that, that even in a Jew's self, he values others. That is a result of there being an alternative self exposed there and moderating yourself. But if there would be no alternative self, then... <laughs> then, then all you'd be is yourself. You know? it's, again, that's not a, a fascinating thing. That would be the natural, simple course of things. Like we like mentioning at this point to Tanya, that, uh, that what he says here, every single psychological book in the world says this. Every guy who ever wrote a book in psychology, this was his first conclusion. He's right. It's not a chidush. Saying that a Jew is, other, is, is different than that, that his self is different, that's a chidush. Okay? That, that's a, a strange thing to say. But saying that a non-Jew, just like any other creature, is nothing but itself. Hmm? That goes without saying. That's not a, a chidush. That's, that's the simple image. So what the, the real chidush here is that, that he says that you should notice that because you have a, an, a godly soul that moderates your animal soul as well. That moderated animal soul is expressed by a sensitivity to things other than yourself. You truly sense others. Again, not as part of how you sense yourself, not because you are an enlightened, good person, no, because you feel them. And that is a fascinating thing, to feel something else, like this, to be sensitive truly to something other than yourself. That sensitivity is a result of, of having an alternate self. If you didn't have a countering alternate self, then your initial self would existentially lack any sensitivity. That's what he says in the next few lines. That the goyim, and they don't have they don't have a moderated self. They don't have klipas night because they don't have a godly self. So they, they're, they're just themselves. That's what he calls here klipa, bad, like the, the, the real bad, what he calls initially self and not self, kedusha and klipa. So they're completely klipa, they're not moderated. And Mishal klipot meot, she'ain ba'in tov klav. Moshe katu ba'ez chayim sh'anam teper, like the Arizal says. V'choltivu de'avdin ha'umot le'garma yu avdin. And what they do good, what you see, good practice also amongst the nations. So they admit it's all part of their sense of self. It's all just serving themselves. Yeah. So a creature, any creature lacks the capability of being anything other than itself or expressing anything other than itself. That that a Jew has that capability stems from having an alternate self. If you didn't have that alternate self, then there'd be no reason for you to be anything but yourself. That, that, that alternate self even softens your own self. It's another chidush. Again, it's, it, there's no logical reason for this to be done. And they met by the going, it doesn't exist. 
and also the good they do, at the end of everything, it's all evolving around themselves. Kedeita Bagemara, like the Gemara says, on the Pasuk, the verse, the Chesed Leumim Chata. The Gemara explains what does it mean, Chesed Leumim Chata? She quotes the Kava Chesed, Shumot Aulam Osim, and Anna Elitia Her, with all the all the good things the Goyim do, like it says there about the Romans, that they, they, they uh, made streets and marketplaces. And it's okay, so the, the marketplaces was in order to do business. That's where they put their prostitutes. That's what the Gemara says. And the streets that they paved were for their armies to be able to get through. But the core of it all is that it's all lihit yahel. What does it mean lihit yahel? To fuss about themselves. All the good you do, the, again, the goy does. Also, this goy, obviously, it's not some far goy. We're also a goy. First, we're a goy. Then we're also Jews. What he says that we have good in our animal soul, we have, it goes without saying that we have this bad. Obviously, we also have interests. The Kiddush was that in our animal soul, we also have, a, again, a moderate life. But that, that we also have interests, that's obvious. So this part, is mutual for us and for the whole world. And this is the logical part. So if you also, if you read Freud's psychology, he was a Jew, but again, he didn't, he didn't write his psychology from a Jewish inspirational point. And it's, uh, and he writes like any other psychologist, any other boy, that everything evolves around yourself. Wow. Though you, you can see in Freud's history that he didn't really believe it. Like when the Nazis came around, then he had broken like a twig. He snapped. He couldn't believe. Couldn't believe that something like that could happen. You know, the World War II, the, the, the atrocities of the of the Nazi regime were a tr very traumatic experience for, for Freud. He couldn't believe that it could come to that. Even though, again, he writes it in all of his books that this is how it is. But he didn't really believe it. You know, he had, again, you, even in him, you can see his the soft and like Jewishness. Now, again, in the world of psychology, it's very interesting because it, a lot of his students, his successors, like we like mentioning Jung, he was a believer. He was a goy. He was a big Christian believer. And his, and his, uh, his psychology, his books are full of faith and full of, again, full of collective conscience. A lot of very spiritual Faithful things. He, he was a, a goy. Freud was mamish, very goyish. <laughs> you know, you know, still, you can see that the personality, the people themselves. Obviously, I didn't know either of them personally, but uh, still, there's that impression. You know, again, I'm biased, but that's how I see. That's how I feel. You can see the difference. That, that's the point here. That, that he makes. That the, the core of being is just being. And that that your being is sensitive to other beings is itself a result of your alternate self. And without that, then just being is just you. You just you just you are what you are, and your entire existence is an experience at that point. And whether you do good or do bad, it's all serving your own self. That's it. That's just who you are. It's not it's not a trap. It's not a trick. It's just it's just the simple mathematics of existence. That that a Jew is different than that is a result of not being himself entirely, as we'll see in the next chapter. So let's say this. So that's, uh, that's chapter one, Baruch Hashem, finally. And uh, next week we can go into, uh, we'll start chapter two. I just know the name of the baby. Uh, well, we don't, uh, there's no name yet. We haven't had a bris. The bris is on Let Friday. Us says, know. Let us uh, know. I'll let you know, yeah. The bris uh, also, uh, nobody, it's, it's by the Rav and the, uh, I don't, nobody can come. Oh, ten men. That's what we were. We were uh, permitted. What so, day is it? What day did you say? Thursday. Thursday morning in Kfar Chabad. But ten men, mamish, me, my brother, we my won't father, crash. my shver, and the Moyel and the Rav and Etiel and Imri. That's what. <laughs> that's what's gonna be. Bezvat Hashem, Baruch Hashem. We should also, in the in in the opportunity, Bezvat Hashem, we should all uh, pray that the Rav feels much better and has strength. Amen. And healthy and can go back to teaching classes and all this mess goes away we can all get back to